What's up everyone, uh, it's Goro Fujita here and welcome to my live stream. Um, I usually do this stuff only for my uh, Patreon supporters. So once a month I do a live stream, but um, this is a year in special, so um, this is for everyone. And I'm gonna do another live stream for my $9 tier supporters next Sun <coughs> excuse me, next Sunday. So um, um, yeah, make sure to go to Patreon if you're interested, you know, and tune in. Um, there's also like other tiers that I have. Uh, um, if you pay more than $9, like I have a $12 tier that comes with like this like neat little print. You know, like if, if, <clears throat> if you want to choose other tiers, just like bigger prints like this. And then all the way up to this jumbo sized print. And those two bigger size prints, they also come with an original signature. Um, so if you're interested in those tiers, uh, make sure to check out my Patreon uh, website. It's www.patreon.com slash Goro. Um, but man, what a week, right? Uh, if you haven't seen it, um, Worlds and Worlds, one of my uh, pieces that I painted in VR, uh, went viral this week. And... Um, now it has close to 2 million views, which is crazy, you know? So for people who haven't seen it, um, this is the piece. Let me show you this. So this piece is entirely painted in a tool called Quill that we developed at Oculus Story Studio. Um, it's a VR painting tool and um, to do this, you need some extra hardware. It's like one of those uh, VR goggles here. Uh, it's the Oculus Rift. And then you also need those motion controllers. They look like this. Neat little motion controllers called um, Oculus Touch controllers. And um, a PC with uh, recommended specs. And you can read about the specs on the Oculus website. Um, but the reason I'm bringing this up is because I'm actually also planning to do uh, Quill live streams in the near future. So definitely keep an eye out for that. And while we're talking about this, uh, yesterday I created um, a Facebook group called Virtual Painting. So this is the side here. Um, the group is open to the public. So... Um, you can just uh, post your VR artwork here. And VR paintings um, done in tilt brush or like quill, you know, you can just post post it here and um, yeah, build a little community, be part of it, right? So I've done this when Photoshop was still an underground movement. And um, there's like not many times where like a tool comes along where you can be there from the beginning, right? Where you can participate to develop um, a community. And Photoshop was, t when I was starting, like still an underground movement, not many people knew about it. And um, it was really cool because there was like all those artists all over the world um, sharing their art. And um, that actually also motivated me to do more and more. And um, it was a big part of my growing process. And um, those friends I posted with are now, I met them throughout the years and now are my friends and peers. It's it's pretty remarkable. So that's why I created this group. I want to create, start helping to create like a community of VR art. And you see that some people started already posting stuff here. Um, where you see like here James Lewis, he just posted like a little video of his quill piece, which is really cool, you know, and people were posting tilt brush stuff. This is another painting I did. And um, so this is really cool. So if if you have a Rift, you know, or, or a uh, Vive setup, um, um, yeah, join the group and start posting your art. I'm super excited about this. But... Um, for today, uh, for today's live stream, I'm gonna go back to Photoshop, and I want the live stream to be as dynamic as possible. So what that means is, um, 50% of the image that I'm gonna create today is planned. 50% is freestyle, um, which means that I.
kind of like know what to paint, but I don't quite know how to execute it yet. And this session will be approximately 60 minutes long. The live stream material will be available for later view on Patreon, and I will, I'm gonna post the links everywhere, so don't worry about that if you have to leave or if you can't make it to the stream. And I'll do my best to keep an eye out on the chat too, so don't hesitate to ask questions, and I will try to answer them along the way. So let's get started. So you guys see this all okay, right? We have 133 viewers, cool. All right. So um, this is like uh, a sketch I did last night. I, mean, I did the sketch because um, uh, the more important part that I want to show is the coloring process. So um, just to quickly go over the sketch, you see this grid in the background. This is uh, a simple um, brush that I created. Um, so let me turn off the opacity here. So basically, um, this is the vanishing point brush, and what I can do is like I can scale it. It's nothing fancy. It's just a brush, and I'm gonna make those brushes available after this session ends as well. So I'm gonna post the link to the live stream and the brushes so people can download those as well. And um, so if I have the vanishing point here, and if you need another vanishing point um, on the other side, um, far over here, what you can simply do is just duplicate this section and then mirror the selection. So that way you can create a vanishing point that's like far on the right side, right? Like then that's difficult to do. You don't want to overscale your brush like that. So this is basically how I created the grid. And based on the perspective grid, I just did like a simple sketch like this. And um, so I'm going to just get started. So this sketch is just divided into uh, the grid and the sketch itself, nothing fancy here. So I'm gonna basically, yeah, let me turn down the opacity here and start with a background gradient. So I have the gradient tool selected. I'm gonna pick like a sky color or something like this here. Um, let's see. All right, yeah. I want to I wanna also have some ground color, so um, this gradient is now set to um, foreground and background color. So let me see what we can do here. This looks cool. Um, and this is my base I want to start with. And then I'm going to basically extract the ground. So I can see this is the horizon line, see? And then with Control J, I can just duplicate the selection and then change the value. So the reason I do this is um, I like to um, always um, separate the background from the foreground. Um, that way you have maximum control. So what I'm gonna do now is add some color to it. So I, I'm gonna turn on this function here called uh, Lock Transparent Pixels. What it does is when I, you paint over the edge, it doesn't go beyond. If you have this selected, um, unselected it just goes over right so this is like a really cool function that i use all the time and um it's really helpful if you want to use big brushes and block stuff and really quickly so i'm imagining to be the ground like this guy this little robot is like a let's say he's like a leaf collector or something like this and uh, he's playing with his cat while he's collecting leaves and um i'm just gonna Add some color variations to the ground. And also to the background. So I'm gonna, for now, I'm gonna create another extra layer for like uh, the background itself. So I'm using just a regular texture brush here that I created. This is cool. And add some more color variation here. And then this doesn't look like leaves yet. This is like the base color, right? So um, I want to try to do something here. Let's see. Um, so this is like a neat little trick um, that I found over the years. Um, I'm going to create like a patch of leaves right now. Um, 
just with a selection tool, I'm just randomly drawing some leaves. Gwendolyn is saying um, she has sound problems. Can you hear me now? Okay, Gwendolyn. She's one of the regulars from Patreon. Thanks for the support, Gwendolyn. You're awesome. So this is like, um, I'm basically creating like a patch and I'm gonna also add a little bit of details. I'm just gonna have the square brush here um, and indicate some, um, what's going on here? Um, there you go, some shadowing. Doesn't have to be anything fancy. And then I'm gonna turn on the lock transparent pixels functionality again and add some more, more color. So we have 147 people. That's not too bad. That's definitely my biggest live stream so far. So what I'm doing here is um, just adding some details. Does this look like leaves? It kind of does, right? So that's pretty cool. And what I'm gonna do is this is now, um, I can make this a brush, but I can also make this a mixer brush. And what a mixer brush does, which is pretty cool. So I'm, I'm choosing like a brush like this. Let me show you what this brush does. So with a regular brush, um, you will see it's like a brush, just a texture brush like this. I'm gonna share this one as well. But now I use this as a mixer brush, which is this one, right? So with uh, sh Shift and B, you can select, cycle through those different brushes. And then um, important is that this is um, set to dry heavy load. And then um, sample all layers is clicked off. And what I'm gonna do now is this layer um, I'm gonna make this a mixer brush. So I create and use this texture brush, make this pretty big, hold alt and sample this piece, right? Now I go back to my background there and now I can start painting those leaves on the ground. Isn't that cool? And then I can always resample it so it looks different, slightly different. Let me make the brush a little bit bigger, sample it again and then just paint. And I'm not too worried about the, uh, it's getting a bit slow. Let me, let me do something and let me scale this down and then sample it again and then use that sample. Now, now we're talking. So the cool thing is like, um, it maintains all the colors and stuff. So, and the shading. So you can like easily get s a lot of details super fast. So um, I'm gonna share this brush, but I'm not gonna share the mixer brush sample. And the reason for that is not because I don't wanna share with you guys, but because um, this already has my painting language and my understanding of shape and color uh, built in. And um, I see a lot of paint, uh, people using like tree brushes and leaf brushes from other artists. And then if you do that, it's not really you. So I see a lot of like paintings out there online that uh, look like they have different styles within one painting because they use brushes from other people's, um, other people's um, work, right? So. Um, that's always a problem that I see. Like you should always create your own custom brushes. So that's why the brushes that I'm sharing with the world are usually um, <clears throat> more generic. So you can really tell the shape. It doesn't really have a design. So what I'm gonna do is I'm um, changing, changing the sh uh, hue a little bit and pick it again and then just add some more variation. Right. So this is pretty cool. So this gives like a really cool base to start with. And then I'm just gonna make it darker because I want 
and change the color a little bit. Maybe saturate it a little bit more, actually. Let me see. And make it a little bit darker, because I always start with a shadow color first. And then, once I have this base, I can go back to a regular brush over here. And I have this leaf brush here. Um, and add some more variation after the fact that I did the mix-up brush stuff. So I can just add some variation here. Maybe bring some greens in for grass. So I'm going to use the cube brush here, the rectangular brush. Just add some more variation. So, uh, Sur, what, what's your name? Suraj? Suraj has a question. Yeah, shoot. I'm looking at the chat, so just ask away. So I'm just um, adding some variation here, some atmospheric perspective right here. And I'm going to do something similar um, soon with the background, um, just to get some texture in. Um, but let me let me finish out the ground here a little quick, um, adding some more stuff. Oh, this is really cool detail now. Um, I'm gonna do I'm gonna put this in a folder called Mixer Brush, and just drag that in there. And I create a new layer, and I'm gonna do like another uh, Mixer Brush sample for the bushes in the back and maybe for the trees. So um, I'm probably I'm probably gonna light things from the top. Um, so Suraj is asking if there is an equivalent to a mixer brush in Procreate. Not that I know of, but um, I don't rely on those tools. Like I usually actually paint everything from scratch right now. Like I'm trying to show some tricks that might be useful for people, but um, this is not crucial to have at all because if you can paint a mixer brush, you can paint everything from scratch as well. So no, uh, Procreate doesn't have that, but um, I never really requested it either, either because what I like about Procreate it is like so dead simple. And um, that's what makes that tool so intuitive and awesome. You know? If you want to do like some more heavy lifting, then you can do it in Photoshop. But the cool thing about um, Procreate that is that it's so simple. So Carlos Rivera is asking, uh, what is more difficult, uh, like painting in VR or painting in 2D? Um, it really depends. Um, depends on how you learned how to paint. Um, I was paint, uh, trained digitally, but I paint like a traditional painter. So basically, my lighting is very planned and rational because I study light and color. So for me, I was always I always think in 3D when I paint um, in 2D. So for me, it was like a pretty easy transition because all I need to do is transfer my knowledge into 3D. But for people that um, are more illustrative, they might have trouble to... Um, adapt their work into 3D, right? So, so it really depends. And um, some people are m more text heavy, some people are less. So, but, but I have to say like um, VR painting is very intuitive and it's one of the mo best things I've ever done. So the funnest thing I ever done. So what I do, I, I haven't explained what I'm doing. I'm doing the same as the ground here. I created like um, a mixer brush sample, but look how fast I can get detail in. Isn't it crazy? This is really cool. So one thing I did, did here is I didn't preserve the mixer brush at all. So I actually painted on the layer of the mixer brush, but I don't mind now. Now it's too late. So I'm not going to bother. So maybe there's some leaves on top. I will just indicate some stuff here. Maybe I can even use that here for the grass a little bit. Um, so let's see. <coughs> So we have this. This is cool. Um, I'm gonna put this into over the background layer, and then um, let's see. 
what is this? I'm just going to merge it with this. All right. So I'm going to go back to hide this mixer brush panel here. Um, going to go back to the brush and just paint over this stuff a little. So everything gets included better. And then um, let me add some more trees in the background. So I'm going to create a new layer and just add some trees, um, including the atmospheric perspective. So I'm going to do this. Oops, turn off the rulers. So I'm not going to spend too much time on these trees because I know I'm going to blur them. I'm going to simulate some sort of depth of field. So uh, Amai is asking, is animation in VR like traditional stop motion? There's no rule to that. It's it's just so VR is just another medium, right? So if there's a stop motion tool, it's gonna be like stop motion. If there's an animation tool, it's gonna be like like curved animation, like in Maya, that's gonna react like that. So it's it's not the VR doesn't define animation. VR is basically just a medium where you can do animation with, but uh, how to execute it is up to you and up to the software, right? So there's no rule specific rule to that at all. All right, add some more color variation here. Maybe some reds might be nice to have it in here. It's starting to look cool. Okay, so now I'm gonna um, prep the characters. So I'm gonna bring back the sketch. Uh, let me hide this so I can see the sketch better. And then I'm just gonna use the lasso tool. I want the robot to be aqua colored or something teal, you know. So I'm just gonna roughly outline it. And um, I have this, uh, the back button here, the top button set to fill with foreground color. So what I can do is just I can select it, fill, select it, select things and then fill again, which is like really convenient and fast. So you can block in um, forms and stuff really quickly. And this is actually the first time that I have the split screen, split screen going on. I think this is pretty cool. I don't know why I didn't do that earlier, but um, I can actually show you guys what I'm doing. And you get an idea how I work. So I'm just um, blocking in the, the basic shape with a solid color. I don't worry about the color at the moment because I can, this layer is isolated so I can make it any color I want. I just want it to be, what I like to do is like I have this robot on a separate layer that will help me to manage um, my workflow better. So, these are the legs, feet. <coughs> And of course, he needs arms. Christopher is asking, "Have you, um, have you used Studio for iPad? What's your opinion about it?" No, I haven't. And um, a lot of people actually ask me, "Have you tried this? Have you tried this?" I used to try a lot of apps, but I always come back to the same things, right? I, I used to try to use Painters, try to use Autodesk Sketchbook, but I end up using Photoshop all the time. And the uh, same goes for Procreate. Procreate is by far, for me, the most intuitive painting tool and the fastest out there in the market, too. So, And I'm in contact with them constantly. Like um, We talk about what to improve and stuff like that. So. That's definitely my tool of choice um, concerning the iPad. So, okay, that's a difficult name. Pra Prabhakaran is asking how to get better at color and light. Any best practices? So it's all about practice and s studying, right? <clears throat> so what I did is, excuse me. <clears throat> what I did is that I 
Excuse me. Need some water. <clears throat> Let's see. Yeah, that's better. So what I did is um, I studied a lot from reference photos. And that's basically what helped me the most. And um, I did daily paintings. You can read all about it on my blog and also on my Facebook page. There's like links to my tutorials. <clears throat> but um, I did this daily practice routine, which basically I painted 365 paintings in a year. It's all like very quick 30-minute uh, drawings, uh, paintings. And that basically helped me to grow. But the key is practice. <coughs> Excuse me. I'm getting over a little cold here. That's why I think I have some st stuff stuck in my throat. <laughs> so yeah, but you definitely have to target, target it, target it and really focus on what you want to learn, right? There's no magic trick or something where you can accidentally get good at color you actually have to study it. And there's books out there. I can't recommend any books because I did not learn from books. I'm mostly self-taught. <coughs> but um, you can read about how I approached my, um, how I uh, studied light uh, on my Facebook page. So Athena is asking, once you get proficient in dig digital painting, painting, is it pretty easy to move from one program to another without any issues. <coughs> yeah, I mean, excuse me. <coughs> All right. <coughs> so, geez, what's going on? <coughs> excuse me. So now my voice is back. Weird. So, um, yeah, I mean, everything is just a tool, right? So if you know the craft, then um, you can paint with anything. If you are like an amazing watercolor painter, then you can also paint with uh, coffee, right? So coffee with paper um, and you would be still good. So it doesn't matter which tool you use. It's just what matters is what tool you feel most comfortable with and um, what speaks to you. You know, so the program really doesn't matter. So that that's why I can paint in Quill in VR just as well as I can paint in Photoshop because because of that, right? Because it's all just a tool. Um, the tool itself doesn't make you a better artist. It's you yourself who does it. And if you're if you have a solid understanding of color and light or composition and drawing and form. Um, then you can do anything with any tool. So Photoshop just happens to be my tool of choice here and Quill is my tool of choice for VR. But that doesn't mean that everybody has to use that because maybe that doesn't speak to some other people, you know. And then I know people that paint in Sketchbook. And it's just their tool of choice. <coughs> so Carlos Rivera is asking, you can draw in high precision the first try. I'm not sure what you mean with that. Can you elaborate on that question? So I'm just going to um, keep uh, drawing those uh, Filling in those layers. So I'm going to put this underneath here. This is like the leaf, the leaf pile that he has in his hands to drop it on the cat. <laughs> it's just playing. It's nothing, no malicious intent here. Joe is asking, have you ever used alchemy? No, no, I haven't. I don't even know what that is. <coughs> so I'm just going to draw leaves here.
Sharon is asking how to get good at Photoshop painting. Um, the question is more how do you how do you get good at painting, right? It, the tool really doesn't matter. It's um, it's practice. You have to study. Uh, there's classes you could take. What I did is I just studied and painted every day for years, and um, that's how I got better and better. But um, there's no no not one way to do it you know like i mentioned it before maybe you just joined but i mentioned before that i have um um links on my facebook page and also on my blog uh, how i created for myself a routine a daily routine to learn how to paint Yeah, this is starting to look cool. This is a little bit too even compositionally, so I'm gonna remove some of those leaves here, or I'm gonna move them around. So maybe put them here just to distribute them better. Because you don't want it to be everything too evenly spread, because then it looks too average, uh, all like um, evened out, and that's not cool. So this way, put the cat. Let me rename those layers so you guys can see. This is cat, this is the leaves, and this is the robot. So currently I'm just still just drawing masks for everything. Uh, color comes later. And this is the beauty of digital painting that you have the luxury to do something like this. You can't do, it's hard to do in acrylic paintings. I mean, the cool thing with acrylics is, for example, that you can always paint over it. With oils, it's a little bit harder. So, um, it leaves, gives you the chance to decide things later on because you have everything on layers. So that's like the big difference between traditional paint and digital paint, which doesn't make the painting easier. It just makes the process easier. So let's see what people are asking. Um, oh, there's a lot of questions. Okay. Uh, so Prabhakaran is asking, do we always need a clean sketch to start painting or just rough sketch will do? It's, it, there's no rule to that. I'm not setting a rule. This is not one way, and this is not the one and only way to do it. I know people that sometimes I even start without a sketch, right? So it's really up to you. And there's no rule to how you approach your painting. And John is asking why I always start with a uh, background gradient. I don't always start with a background gradient. I just, um, it's just a quick way to get um, some color variation in there. And um, I always start with a background though, not with a background gradient necessarily, but with a background because the background will determine the lighting. And then I, once I know the lighting, then I can um, put anything in the scene and light it the way I want. Uh, another, question is let's see um you have some great ideas for your paintings is there any method on how you come up with your concepts that's also a question that i that's a question by athena and that's a question that i get quite often um it's also training like um i made a conscious effort to really um put stories in my pieces my um a former classmate he looked at my paintings and he would it's like a tower desert or something with a guy standing on a rock and then he would ask what is this guy doing and I'm like I, I don't know what that guy's doing he's just I thought it's just cool to put it there because you know for scale and he said yeah that's the wrong approach though like you need to know what that guy is doing tell a story you know don't just put random stuff in your painting without knowing what you're doing what that person is going through because then the painting might compositionally look great, but it doesn't give me anything. Like if I look at your painting right now, it doesn't give me anything. I don't get any emotion. So that's a problem. And I was like, oh yeah, you're right, huh? And then I started like really trying to uh, bring story into my concepts. <coughs> and um, that was a conscious effort. And the more I did it, um, the more I got better at it. I mean, I still struggle, you know, sometimes um, I am not as inspired at all and I might not have the greatest ideas, you know, but the, the, 
the key is that um, the more you do something, the better you get at things, right? So that's that's really it. There's no no real uh, secret to how to come up with ideas. It's more like um, I've been doing it for a long time, for over 12 years now. So that's why um, I got better at it throughout the time. So what else do we have here? How much time do I spend on ideas? That's a pretty vague question. It depends. <laughs> like, like when I work on like a specific project, of course, I spend more time when I just doodle around for myself. I just like to start spontaneously without really any plans, you know. So that's that really highly depends on what I'm in the mood for. There's no like, oh, I only give myself like 30 minutes of time to think about what I'm going to paint. I, I don't like to restrict myself like that because you don't gain anything out of that. It's it's better to just, the yeah, time limits are good when you practice things like painting, you know, but if you want to work on an idea, take all the time you need. I'm just creating like a little basket here, like a backpack. I think I messed, screwed up the perspective here, so let me fix that. It's more like this. Okay, um, this is this is good for now. Um, so I'm gonna start now. Uh, what's the time on our stream now? Uh, we are at 37 minutes, so this this stream is gonna take a little bit longer than an hour. Um, because I'm talking a lot. <laughs> so let me start painting, get busy here. So I want this guy to be like, so what I'm doing here is I'm determining the shadow color. So I want this guy to be like kind of teal colored. Uh, the cat will be white. And because the cat, the sky is blue, the cat's shadow color will be, um, will be more something like uh, bluish. And we have warm bounds coming from the floor, but maybe this is like a good shadow color for the cat. And then we have the backpack here. So, So I just use um, different uh, levels adjustments and Q adjustments to do this. Uh, shortcuts are Control L and Control U. Um, those are the leaves. So let me change the leaf color. Yeah. And this is a good base. Um, all right. So let's get started here. Um, the robot and the backpack. I put everything on. Uh, lock transparent pixels. I am not able to paint beyond those existing pixels. And then I just start painting in the color. So I'm going to indicate for you guys where I'm thinking to light this from. So I want the face to be in shadow so I can make his eyes glow. So I'm probably light it from here. So this is the light direction. Light. And this now sets everything up for me, right? And right now, I already know what the end product will look like. And that's also because of the years of experience. Like now I just have to execute this, like this lighting situation. So what that means is like I have um, highlights over here. And this light comes from the top and then I'm going to start painting in the joints just to add some separation, the eyes, so maybe the jaw piece here. So Barsha is asking if is this live stream going to be uploaded somewhere. It's going to be in this live stream post. So it's going to be online forever and free for you to watch. I'm gonna post the links everywhere so you won't, you can't miss it.
So Purvesh is asking, is there any suggestions for 3D artists about lighting and composition? I can only repeat myself. It's There's no shortcut to do stuff, right? So it's really about studying light. Like if you want to get better at lighting and composition, then you can study it. You know, uh, uh, I um, said before that I'm self-taught, but there are books out there that you can learn from. And... Um, I have a lot of live streams where I talk about lighting and color uh, that you have instant access to the moment you support me on Patreon. I believe, are you, are you my Patreon supporter? I'm not sure, but um, I have a lot of tutorial videos and live streams there where I talk about all, uh, lighting and stuff, but it's up to you like what sources you choose. Um, the key is basically to really study it and um, yeah. It doesn't come by itself. Thanks for the for linking, Alyssa. That's helpful. So if you guys um support me for nine dollars and up, um, you will have access to all of my live streams that I've had done in the past. So it's not just that you see only the newest ones; you have access to all of them. Oh, might be something you want to consider. So I'm just like um, coloring this guy in here and you know like I want some more to separate him from the background I want actually some more trees in the background so I'm just gonna indicate this here and see how now the lighting reads much better. So Gwendolyn, you're asking, I noticed that you painted standing. Is it better to draw? No, I just, that's what I do. <laughs> I just stand because I, when I sit, I slouch and um, I started getting back pains and stuff like that. And I can't control my slouch. I'm just slouching. <laughs> I just get lazy and then I get sleepy too. So that was a conscious decision of mine just to um, do a standing desk. And um, for me, standing is not a big deal anymore it used to be it was very exhausting but now i can just stand for hours and um it's all right but i do have like a standing mat uh, so uh it's not too hard on my feet when i stand okay so um let me now do some magic with the background um, i'm gonna basically reduce those flatten those to one layer and then i'm just gonna add a filter Blur filter and blur the background a little bit. So this will give it a photographic sim cinematic effect here. And Joe is asking what did I use to do the worlds and worlds piece. It's written everywhere, dude. It's like, it's called Quill. It's done by Oculus Story Studio. It says in the video and it's also like mentioned a gajillion times in the post. But I don't blame you, but <laughs> yeah, it's called Quill and it's a VR painting tool and you need the Oculus Rift goggles and the touch controllers. It's a free software package. So if you have the Rift and the PC and the touch controllers, you can test it out right away. So I'm gonna blur this section as well. Oops. So what I'm doing here is like I'm just creating a feather radius and uh, you can go here from select modify feather it's, uh, it's uh, shift F6 and then um, it creates a feathered selection I'm just blurring the ground a little. So, so what questions do we have? Am I asking why robots? Um, because I like them. <laughs> Simple as that. I like robots. And it became like a thing that I like to draw and I like to give them personality. I don't like those transformer style killer robots as much, you know, that, that seems to me a standard and I wanted to give a twist on it, give them personality and make them like super nice. 
machines that actually don't want to kill. They just want to live among us and enjoy the nature. So here I'm like jumping around, um, adding details here and there. So um, just lighting the cat now. So now I start thinking about the bounce light as well because the ground will be lit, you know, and so the, um, the light will bounce, warm light from the leaves will bounce back. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to use um, just a levels adjustment to add some pools of light here. So, you know what, I'm just going to do, I'll show you what I do here. So I, Create a levels adjustment layer, group it by holding Alt to only affect the bottom layer, and then bring this value up like this. So this is the lit section. It's a little bit different from what I usually show. Um, usually just I paint the colors directly, but what I can do now is I can invert this uh, levels thing and make it black, and then I can use, this is a mask, and then I can use the white color to basically bring, <coughs> show what's uh, basically to mask areas that I want to light. So this way I can now use like a leaf brush like this and really bring back the light, which is really cool. I'm going to use a different brush here, maybe a soft brush for the background. So uh, Raul is asking, what do you do for inspiration, motivation when you're going through an art block phase? Um, again, like you have to just stand up and keep working. Like I had phases where I couldn't paint for two weeks, but I still painted. And what I usually do then is I just um, do things where I don't need inspiration, right? So I can do like um, little studies from reference and then... Um, that way you can still learn and you don't have to think of an idea or anything and you can just keep painting. That's like something that worked for me where I just focus more on learning rather than creating. So David is asking, do you try to keep little transparency on your brush at all times? So do you switch opacity? Um, yes, I have this option on most of the times, which is like pen pressure, map to pen pressure. That way I can control um, the amount of opacity on the fly, which I like doing. That answers your question. All right, so this is starting to look really cool. And then um, I can even emphasize this a little bit more. And then I will go back to black and um, bring down the background a little bit. Black, yeah. Or something like this. Yeah, this this is starting to look really cool. I'm gonna just uh, merge this there. I don't like to keep things complicated. So I have this now um, as a default layer, and then I'm gonna add some more hits of color. So maybe there's like a bright leaf, translucent leaf here, and just adding some more visual interest. where the light hits. And we're already at 49 minutes. That was quick. I guess when I talk, I'm not as fast as I thought I would be. But I added some extra time buffer. I'm fine. I hope you guys are fine with time, you know. But as I said, um, this stream's gonna stay online for later view. You can watch the replay whenever you want. All right, so this is starting to look really cool. Like I really feel the light, so, okay. This is nice. And now I see that the cat, see like w when I paint like this, um, I react to what I see on the fly. And now I see that the cat is way too blue because now there's so much warm light around it, right? So the blue might only appear on the back side of the cat because there's no bounce light hitting, hitting it. But um, right now I'm gonna, hit the cat full on with a bounce light from the ground. A 
This is cool, right? It's like magic. I love this when things come together like this. And then um, some light on the arm here, on the paw. And then the inner, the inside of the ear will be like colored in red. Like that. Let me adjust my mat here. Matt slid off the ground a little. Oh, Corinna is in the house. I didn't see you. Also regular from Patreon. From Germany, my home country. Even if I'm Japanese, I grew up in Germany. So lived there for 25 years. Quite a long time. So I'm just painting in the bounce night here. This is starting to look really nice. This is cool. Okay, and then the reason why the shadow is blue is because the sky is blue. And then um, that's reflected in the shadow color. And now I can also start uh, painting on the robot again. So you see that I paint on everything at the same time. So I'm gonna use like the square brush again and, and indicate some bounce light. The bounce light will look slightly less strong on the robot because he is blue and then the blue surface won't um, reflect the light as much. So. It's probably more something like this instead of the yellow. So this looks better. It's my more greenish, warm brown side here. And just keep going. So, Corinna, it's actually raining here too. It's very rare. But um, here in California, it has been raining all last week, which is crazy. And we need the rain. And so right now, I think, let me see. It's dry outside right now, but uh, it has been raining last night. So we're happy about it, though, because we have a rain problem. We didn't have any rain for the last two seasons. So it was like really, we had a, we're in a drought, so we need it more than anyone right now. But yeah, it has been raining miraculously. All right, uh, so I'm gonna do the metal joints now. So metal reflects everything, right? So uh, let me answer this question. So Prop Hakaran, can you have a simpler name? <laughs> Just kidding. And Prop Hakaran is asking, how do you avoid to be too perfect i guess how how do you know when to stop well just don't get caught up into details and this is also like um part of uh, the daily practice if you set yourself a time limit of 30 minutes for practice and um you stick to the 30 minutes then you you don't have time to work on details and that's something i learned through my 30 minute paintings is that you learn how to organize your thoughts and you know how to like um, work on the entire image at the same time. I mean, y y so you basically what you want to do is that you you can save your image at any time of the process and it, it looks somewhat finished. If I save my painting now, it already looks finished somewhat, right? I can always detail it. I can spend weeks on this to make it more detailed, but you see all the elements I needed for painting this picture are already in there. That's why it already looks decent. A lot of people start like, um, working on maybe like this area uh, only and then um, the time runs up and then all you have is this area right and then then that doesn't work because then you will lose tremendous amount of time by doing this so I like to always work on the entire image at the same time so you see that I'm jumping around back and forth from one object to another um, because I need to see how 
things develop. Like I react to what I see. So when I add bounce light, then I have to adjust the shadow side. When I add highlight, I have to adjust this and that. So it's basically, I instantly react to what I see and that's why it's important to like really work on um, the entire piece at all times. And I always zoom out to, to see where things are going. So right now I'm like adding the metal parts, um, like dividers and segments and stuff like that, segmentations. All right, so like I said, metal reflects, right? So metal reflects everything. So to get a metal um, um, sense for like, uh, illusion of metal. I, I'm just gonna reflect the environment. So I'm reflecting the sky here. I'm reflecting the ground and then I will also reflect like what's around. So this is around the trees and the bushes, right? So I add some of the greens there. Maybe there's some highlights. And then look at that. It looks like brushed metal already. Same with this. This will like probably reflect more of the greens because it's like facing the greens. So this is what I meant with how I think in 3D already. Like I'm, I'm thinking of what's surrounding this robot, right? So it's like the invisible stuff that I'm thinking of right now. And um, some of this stuff is visible. So this is the sky and then we have the ground. Prabha, you're hilarious. He changed the name for, so it's easier for me to pronounce it. Thanks, man. That is funny. So, I'm just adding more stuff here. This is fun, guys. So this is my seventh live stream. There's already like, um, seven live streams on Patreon. So if you decide to support me, become a supporter, you have access to those, just so you know. But look how the metal starts working, isn't it cool? And it's really just like thinking about what's surrounding the metal. And then you can just figure it out. And the thing is like the reflections here don't have to be like physically correct, it's just, sort of physically correct and then the brain fills in the rest this is really cool but yeah you do need to know the basics of what reflections do and if people are wondering how do i do you learn that it's, it's through studying <laughs> like you have to look at metal and see what's going on and i did some exercises regarding reflections where I just put like a reflective like teapot and then just analyze it and try to paint it. So, t oh, Tyler Hagen, Tyler, how's it going, man? Uh, I used to work with him at Oculus, which is cool. And he speaks fluently Japanese. Um, good to see you. So you're asking, uh, how do you choose values to start with the foreground? Um, do you generally s uh, go dark to light? Yes, I do. Uh, the reason why I do this is, um, I think very logically, right? Think of me like a V-Ray renderer or something. Um, that's basically what's going on in my head. So I start with like, the diffuse color, like like um, the base shadow color, and then I turn on the lights. Like here you see that I indicated the light, and um, I can actually emphasize on that. So let me, right. So we have this, then we have the fill light from here, right? This fill. And then we have the bounce light coming from the ground. So this is bounce. So the way I think is like, okay, when I have the key light here, then everything else is in shadow. And when I already de defined the shadow, I only have to turn on the lights one by one. And I like to think like that. Some, some other people work in a different way. What's in my head though, is the local color. So in my head, this robot, 
And this live stream is going to take a little bit longer, but who cares? I want to share my knowledge. So let's see. So in my head, the robot looks like this, right? And then we have his, let me do a side view. So we have this, we have his joints, right? And then he has the jaw here and the, uh, this is like the basically that um the basket that he has on his back. So this is this is in my head. This is the local colors. So what the light does is it brings back the local color. So it shows the local color. In theory, I can just pick this color and then paint this in here, and you see it totally works. Right. So in my head, I think of the character like this, but I paint it in a dark color first so I can turn on the lights one by one. And that way I can totally be very rational about and very schematic about my my workflow. And um, you have maximum control that way. So if that makes sense. I leave, where is this guy? I leave this guy with the notes layer. And I'm going to share with you guys this uh, layer PSD file too, so it's like a giving everything away for free. But I think it's a good thing to do for Christmas. So I'm going to share the brushes that I used, and I'm going to also share the high resolution PSD uh, with all the layers. So go and support me on Patreon. <laughs> All right, this is starting to work really nicely here. And then now I'm starting to add some more surface detail. And then let me see if I can make this jaw more reflective. So he's looking down on the onto the ground. So this would be reflect mostly the leaves. So Raul is asking um, if I had any tips of getting breaking into the concept art industry. Um, the way I did it is I practiced hard, right? I practiced hard and um, networked too. Like I went to conventions like um, SIGGRAPH, FMX, CTN and stuff like that. CTN didn't exist back then, what am I saying? But um, uh, conventions such as those and um, tried to like talk to recruiters and stuff like that. But really the key is to get better. The better you are, the higher the chances are for you to get hired, right? It's not like, um, there, there was a parent at my school where I went to university in Germany. He, we had an open door at school and that parent asked me, so the school is pretty expensive here. Um, if I send my boy here, is he guaranteed to have a job after the school? And I said, no, it's, he's absolutely not. If if he comes here and doesn't do anything and he leans back as lazy and um, not willing to work, then no, he won't find a job. But if he comes here and and works and like becomes a workaholic and you know like works the crap out of it <laughs> and studies, then he will find a job for sure. Right? And then he was like nodding. And that's basically the key. Um, try to always be the best. Like, I know that I'm not the best. There's so many people out there that are like way more skilled than me, but I always try to reach for the best, right? For me, especially, like uh, Corinna can probably confirm living in Germany, but coming overseas to work for like companies like Disney or Pixar is almost impossible because you need to be better than any applicant that applies over here because the company needs to have a reason to sponsor you with a visa. And that's really, really difficult. So <clears throat> I, I was always like shooting for, hey, if I want a job at DreamWorks or Pixar, 
then I have to compare myself to the best, right? And um, that was the motivation I had, and that's how I studied, and that's how I really tried to get better and better. And it got me to a place where I'm now art directing at Oculus Story Studio, which is like, if you would have told me that like 10 years ago, I would have not believed it, you know? But um, time and effort will make you and will allow you to reach your goals and right? like constant practice. So this is starting to look really nice. And I'm gonna see if I can separate myself from the sketch already. Not quite yet, but um, let me work on the highlights a little bit more here. So this is like the jawline. So Rafa is asking why the squ square brush there's no particular, I just like it, that's it. It's again, personal preference. Some people like the soft brush, some people like texture brushes, I like the square brush. But it changes from time to time. Like the square brush is something that I recently started liking and before I was using mostly this guy, the round edged, uh, sharp edged round brush. Doesn't, I just switched to that one, doesn't really matter. It's, it's more important. Oh no, I was painting on the notes layer. Um, okay, no problem. I'm gonna separate all this stuff now from the notes layer. Let me see if I have everything. I do, so I'm gonna hit Control Shift J and that will save this and I wanna merge it with a robot layer. Now we have this again. Problem solved. That happens a lot, actually, that I noticed that I paint on a wrong layer late in the game. But um, that's also the beauty about Photoshop. You actually have layers. You don't have that luxury with acrylic paints. So we're over an hour already. So I'm expecting this to go a little bit longer because I still have ways to go. But uh, it's actually not too much. Hopefully, we can finish this soon. Neil Wong is asking if I attended art school. No, I did not. I went to school for animation and I was an animator for two years in Germany before becoming um, an artist. And um, that was like basically a hobby that I did on the side. Um, I like painting and I started it actually in 2004, um, 2003 to 2004. Before that, I was just drawing all my life, but um, I never thought that would become my profession. So I was determined to become a 3D animator, which I was for a few years. And I thought I was pretty decent at it. And I would have never considered to do art for a living, but that's how it happened. It just happened. Like I posted my art um, everywhere online and um, that's how I got recognition. And that's also like what I recommend you guys to do if you're like upcoming artists, you know, share your work. Don't shy away from like posting work even if you're like still a beginner because people tend to shy away. They're like, no, I don't want to show my stuff. It's so ugly. But if it's ugly, nobody's going <laughs> to look at it and care anyway. But um, if you are persistent and if you grow, people will recognize that and they will see that you're determined and um, you can create strong networks that will benefit you later on in your life. So that's like something I did when, when I posted in online forums that kind of don't, they still exist, but not in that form that they're not very active anymore. But um, when, I was posting in forums like <laughs> nobody would pay attention to my stuff until one day one of the seasoned artists that I always looked up to it's Nicolas Sparth Bouvier you can look him up on Patreon he's awesome uh, not not Patreon sorry on Gumroad he has some tutorials and also um, on his Facebook page his website and stuff like that super cool guy um, he's a friend now like back in the days he was like my icon <laughs> and um at some point he said like, hey Goro, you came a long way, you know, you're doing great. And I was like, oh, oh, oh you know, <laughs> that guy Sparth was like commenting on my work and that motivated me even more. And um, he probably doesn't even remember that, that he 
had such a big effect on my um, artistic growth. You know? But um, yeah, it's, it's really important to show uh, what you're doing, to share your work, um, because otherwise people won't recognize you. That's why I'm sharing this knowledge with you guys too here. Now it's time to give back and hopefully some of you can gain from what I've learned throughout the past. Athena, uh, thank you for your support. She just said she just became a patron. I appreciate it. Thank you so much. So this is starting to look really nice. Like I, I like this, but I need my sketch again so to add some more details. So we are one hour eleven minutes. So you can see, like even if I was talking all the time, I'm pretty far along already, right? And this is because people often ask me, "How do you paint this fast?" But I like to see it as I paint. And uh, this is like a result of 12 plus years, so it's actually not that fast. Like this painting took 12 years. This is the way I like to see it, right? So you might you might think I make it look easy, but that's because I'm like I use all my knowledge that I collected in the past um, to pull this one off. So there's actually a lot of stuff going on in my head while I'm painting this, and you see that I make almost. Like very little mistakes on color, and that's because I studied the hell out of it, right? So I studied so much that I kind of know um, how like shadow colors react and how I, I feel like I still have to learn a lot about that. But I feel like I'm in a pretty decent place, and this is why I can paint fast. But um, because I make less mistakes than I used to do. So um, it's not not so much that I'm just fast. It, it took 12 years to get here. So just, just to give you guys some perspective, it's not something that I was able to do um, from the beginning. This is something I got faster and faster throughout the years. So I, I added some a little leaf logo to show he's like a leaf leaf collecting robot. And then some hinges. Maybe he needs some LEDs here. Maybe like he has some green lights. So those are all spontaneous decisions that I'm doing right here. Maybe a yellow light, orange. Orange will look nice. This is cool. Cool little detail. And then I'm go back to my little rectangle brush and add some shadows to really show. Maybe this is gonna be in the highlight to really separate the arm. You know what? I'm gonna put a highlight on the arm. How about that? That's better. It's a better read. So Maite is saying, you might say you're not the best, but we'll study your work in our digital illustration class next to Pascal Campion. Awesome. I mean, which still doesn't make me the best, right? I don't see myself as at the best at all, but one of the artists, right? So Pascal is a really good friend of mine. He is crazy. He is like amazingly prolific and, um, if you think I'm fast, check out Pascal. He's like a lightning. <laughs> and we have like actually similar paths where we both like animated more than painted and we both started painting around the same time, I believe. And uh, we did this daily painting concept separate from each other and that's how we actually met online. And we noticed that we're doing the same stuff and then finally I met him here. He used to live in the Bay Area. And now I, I just saw him at the CTN convention, which was nice. 
that that guy is something else. Make sure to check out his work, Pascal Campion. All right, this is starting to work really nicely. I'm gonna darken his legs a little bit and maybe add some decals. Uh, maybe add some, turn on the perspective grid to know where I'm at. Maybe add some, some paint on top of his chassis here. This will be mostly straight and then the highlight area will be white. Yeah, starting to look really cool. So Tyler is asking, when you practice before, what kind of stuff did you use for reference? That's a good question. Um, I usually, um, I went to Google, like I also did like live paintings where I went to outside and paint with, um, painted with water soluble oil paintings and um, <clears throat> did that for a while. But I mostly I worked from reference images that I found on Google. Um, but important thing is not to pick like highly photoshopped images like uh, the National Geographic type of images, like of animals and stuff like that. Much more boring stuff than that. You have to look for like a farmhouse with a white fence or something like this, you know, and then um, really see uh, how the, that you have a clear separation between light and shadow. And that will help you to um, understand how lighting works much better. Like diffuse lighting scenarios are like re very difficult to paint uh, when you start off. Um, but if you have uh, references where you see a clear separation of like, oh, this is in the light, this is in the shadow, then you can, it, it makes it easier for you to analyze, analyze it. And um, those are the pictures that I was looking at, you know, like lighthouses, lighthouse or like farmhouse or, you know, like, like trash can, mailbox. And then just random words, type them into Google and then uh, just find the right pictures. It could be just pictures that people randomly have taken. And if you see something cool outside, make sure to also pick up your camera. Thankfully, now these days with the smartphones, everybody has a camera and you can actually just snap a picture, um, archive it in your album for references and then paint it. That's how I approached it. And so I'm adding a little bit of metal effects here and there, you know, like just to, you know what, what's gonna be cool is the underside of the, of this metal segment here reflects more of the orange of the ground. This will look cool, nice. And then I will remove this highlight on top because we won't be able to see it. Okay, now I'm going back to the cat. Go back to the cat, add some more detail like the eyes. Just like a happy cat, rainbow eyes. Oop, what did I do? I think I, I just used this round brush for now. So Rahui is asking, would you suggest any website or something for gathering reference and study? And like, like I said, it's uh, Google, Flickr is good. Flickr is good because there's a lot of um, more nicer photos than on Google image search, but um, I would use Flickr uh, and Corbis is good. Corbis is like a stock photo library, just like Shutterstock and stuff like that. Is it Shutterstock? I think it is. Um, but um, because they, they all come with more watermarks, but you know, you're not gonna paint the watermarks. You're just using those images to study it, so you don't have to like pay for them. But make sure that if you ever post work with reference, then also post the reference alongside with it, or basically make explicit that make clear that you did it using reference, because um, otherwise um, that could backfire on you in the long run. Because not because people would um, get to you because. Uh, 
you used it without permission, but um, people will start thinking that you are trying to hide that you are using reference. So always be clear about that stuff. I think I prefer it without the paw. Leave it simple. Otherwise, there's too much detail. So Martin is asking, do you limit yourself in terms of values you're going to use for painting um, by planning the darkest darks? No, I don't. I like, like a lot of people, they do like those color swatches and on the painting, you know, you, you might have seen these guys, you know, like this, this, this. But I don't see the reason why you would do that unless, like, this is, you do this in real life because you only have those colors. Um, Photoshop gives you all the colors in the world, right? So why would you limit yourself? So no, I, I don't. Um, limiting yourself might be good sometimes for practice. Um, if you want to, like, target specific like value practices where you're like, okay, I only have those three values and I want to learn how to compose and with those, uh, those values. And then it might be useful. But if you do a personal piece, there's no reason for you to limit yourself in colors, at least in my opinion, if that makes sense. All right, so now I'm going to create another layer. Oh, the basket. I totally forgot about the basket. So. Let me add some color to the basket now. I'm going to use like, uh, like a texture brush here to get some sort of texture in there. And then use the line brush to maybe add some detail. I'm like totally screwing out the perspective here, but work on that. Like that. It's cool. And then you guys are like, oh, why is the strap going through his arm? I don't know. It shouldn't. Let's fix that. There you go. And then, so we're at one hour, 20 minutes. It's actually not too bad. So again, metal reflects, right? So what I'm gonna do is like, I let it reflect the sky color, environment color, the ground, and boom, it looks like metal. And then, but add like a little strap here, little strap over there. Starting to look cool. And then also the strap also needs some highlights. Amaya is asking, which was your first tablet and how long did you use it? I had the Intuos 2 tablet first. Um, that was in 2003, I believe. But uh, I don't know how long I used it. It, it doesn't really matter, though. It's, it's not very relevant to when you want to learn how to use things. Like People ask, like, ah, I want to buy a Cintiq because I want to paint like you. Again, it's not about the tool. The tool doesn't make you a better artist. Right, so like there's there's one of my coworkers actually still using like the medium into his tablet at work because he just doesn't he just prefers that over the Cintiq, and I use the Cintiq because I like it better than the tablet, but that doesn't mean that you have to like it better than the tablet, right? So never focus on tools, never, you know, believe that tools can make you better because. Tools only enable functionalities, but not skill. So one guy was um, debating with me on my Facebook page. He said, that's not true. I was playing years of guitar, and once I got another better guitar, I could play way better. And I was like, no, it's, 
it's not the guitar. You were already able to play better. You just didn't know. You know, the the tool didn't make you a better guitar player. You made yourself a better guitar player, and the tool just unlocked what you could already do. Right, and so that's why it's important to not to get too carried away with um, tools. So my Malta is asking, what do you think is the shortest time you would need for painting to be satisfied with? This <laughs> that's a very specific question. I, I don't know, like the shortest time. I can do something decent in fifteen minutes and it doesn't mean that I like it, but I I think I could get to something decent and then if I like it or not, I can paint like for three days and still hate the result, right? So, but other people might like it. It's, it's all relative. So to answer your question short, I need 15 minutes at least to do something that's showable. This is the leaf pile here. So I'm gonna work on the leaf pile a little bit now. So I, I cr separated the layer before. So I will have like um, some different colored leaves here that are like in the light. And some of them are in shadow. Some of them are half in shadow, half in light. So let's see what else questions we have. I thought using, so Marianne is asking, I thought using color from the same family or that are complementaries was better. Uh, I don't know exactly what the question is. Like you see that the robot is complementary to the ground and that was a conscious decision because I wanted contrast and attention to the robot. And um, but there's also no rule. You can make one a painting with all the colors from the same family and still make it look good. It's really a matter of taste and like um, what your objective is, right? So I'm gonna use the square brush again to add some cool tones in the shadows that will make the make the image vibrate. One hour, 28 minutes right now. I think I can stay within the two hour mark easily. But we'll see. So I think I'm pretty close to being finished. So I'm just adding more like blue elements for the shadow area and you will see that it will do magic. It's like really cool. Like it starts, colors start vibrating, you know, by doing this just like, just a tad. I'm back on the ground layer. This is really cool. And then um, maybe maybe some of the grass gets some light here. So I integrate it better. Yeah, this is cool. And then some of the grass has cooler tones. And some of them are much brighter. This is pretty cool. Carlos is asking, do you have any other reference in, on your physical desk? What, what do you mean by reference? Like, I'm not looking at any reference at the moment. Um, but I should be. Like, I'm just not using reference images because I don't have anything handy and I don't want to... Uh, get into like copyright issues when I use like copyrighted material. So I rather shoot the reference myself. So that's one thing. Like um, it's important when I do work for work. I definitely uh, look at references all the time because um, a lot of the things you can't come come up with in your head, right? It's something that you 
there's just some things you need to know. Like, for example, if you ask me to paint a chameleon or something, I do, I'm not going to be able to do that without looking at a reference because I never painted or drew a chameleon. I can try and I might get close to that, but um, it probably won't look good. So it's always important to study from references as well. So this is just like uh, showing a little bit of the leaf pile. Taylor Moore is asking, what is your favorite VR painting tool there? Well, there's only two choices at the moment. There's tool brush and there's quill, and it's definitely quill for me. Just because it doesn't restrict me in terms of uh, canvas size, and it doesn't, it doesn't provide me light, which I like. Uh, tool brush um, has lighting in it, and but when I paint, I want to be stay in control. I want to be in control over the lighting, so I don't want anybody else to basically define light shapes for me or lighting for me. And that's why I like Quill better because it, it's more of a traditional painting experience. So we have the leaves in there. Now the cat, uh, where's the cat? So I'm, I'm gonna use this layer, I believe, or this layer to add more um, leaves and they're gonna also cut into the you see that um, the, the cat is not very well integrated yet, so I'm just gonna add some more leaves to make clear that the little cat is like um, surrounded by those leaves. Just like that. Just add some more variation here and there. And that way it looks like the cat dove into this pile of leaf or the forest ground here. Carlos Vega is asking to talk about Inigo. Inigo is something else. So for anybody who hasn't read it, he basically is the creator of Quill. Um, he, so the Quill is the VR painting tool that people are talking about and um, he actually developed like the first prototype within two days, which was insane. And he's a good friend of mine, and I worked with him throughout the past year to really make Quill the tool. Like now we have a dedicated team for Quill, but um, back in the days it was just Inigo. So I would request a lot of things and he would just implement it right away. And then it's really cool because I was like, hey Inigo, I really need you to add like layer duplicate because without layer duplicate, like, I can't work fast, right? And he said, like, fine, I'm gonna add it. And then he added it, and then I created, like, a whole grass field with real, like, grass strains. And of course, at some point, Quill crashed, right? Because I created, like, a whole grass field, so then it had millions of curves. And then I went to Inigo, and I'm like, hey, Inigo, my quill file crashed and I can't open it. Can you help me out? And he's like, uh-oh, what did you do, Goro? And I'm like, I only painted grass and duplicated it, duplicated it. And he's, and then he was able to open it and he was just face palming. He was like, oh my God, what have you done? You know, <laughs> you're not supposed to do that. Of course it crashes, right? And I'm like, well, the thing is like, uh, and, you know, you, you gave me the, the option to do that, so I'm going to use it. And um, that's how it went with everything we did together. Like, he would unleash, like, unlock a new thing for me, and I would just break it, and then he would fix it. And now we're at a point where it can handle, like, a lot of curves, you know? You can actually create a grass field, and it will, it will hold up, which is pretty cool. So it's, like, good teamwork. So pra, uh, Prapa is asking, how did you consciously make this painting good a composition? So with this composition, well, again, I come back to it's practice. Like I practice composition, I practice lighting, I practice drawing, and this is a result of that. There's no like 
easy way to explain it like oh i did this and this this and this like it's it's years and years of practice that make me able to do that and you can there's also books and stuff uh, about composition there's books about perspective there there's a lot of material out there which i didn't take advantage of when i learned like i didn't learn from books but there is right so it's it's all out there so it's all up to you to learn that and if there was a very easy answer that i can give you right now everybody would be able to paint easily no problem and unfortunately it's not that simple you know that's why like without practice and dedication you won't you won't get far like that's like all up to you you have to make an effort to learn things like other people can't do that for you and tools can't do that for you either so just be aware of that So Amaya is asking why my blog is named Chapter 56. Um, you can actually read about that in the about about section of my blog. Um, basically, in Japanese, I'm Japanese, and in Japanese you can read the numbers five and six as Goro. This is where the idea came from, and uh, chapter is because blogs felt like a diary to me, so it's like my chapter, right? my chapter of my life so that's why it's chapter 56 my website used to be area 56 you know and um now the company name i have is like 56 bit 56 you know color depth which is kind of cool i think a little bit nerdy but i think it's cool okay this is starting to look really cool. Um, let me add some more background detail here. So I'm going to create some more bushes. I think we can have some more color variation back here. Maybe I do something more green. Something green. I want to separate the cat a little bit more. So something like this. And on this side, I might have something more red. Since the light is coming from the top, I'm going to hit those planes a little bit with red. Top planes, same here, maybe some highlights. And this can be really rough because I'm going to blur it anyway. Just to add some more visual interest and color to the piece. All right, and then I go ahead and blur it again. Just around that. Maybe I'm gonna blur the background a little bit more. Let's see how this works. Before, after, I think that's even better like that. And then, um, I'm gonna I'm gonna also blur the foreground a little bit so I'm gonna select this with a shift f6 I feather the selection I can hide the selection by uh, hitting control command H and then I go to blur Gaussian blur and then I blur the foreground a little bit just a tad All right, let's see. Um, I feel like, so now I can abandon the sketch completely. Yeah, I don't need the sketch anymore. And then I can finesse the robot. I'm almost done here. I see it coming. Oops, let me turn on the lock transparent pixels again. And then I'm gonna use the basket layer. No, I'm gonna create a new layer on top to also create some leaves that cover the feet. Just like this. So it really looks like he's standing in the leaves. All right, that's better.
Just, just finishing it up here. And adding some more surface detail. Just like little lines. Adding some asymmetry too. Okay, Tyler, Tyler is leaving. Have a good day, have a good Sunday. You can watch the rest later on the replay. It's nice seeing you. Tyler is an awesome animator. So Niv is saying, what if 60 minutes is not enough for me when studying? Make it enough, <laughs> you know, like make 30 minutes enough. Every day, 30 minutes is actually quite some time, you know. Like, um, the, the key is not to get distracted by details. So just do 30-minute exercises every day, not an hour. An hour is almost too long for learning how to paint, in my opinion. There's not one way to do it, but in my opinion, I think 30 minutes is like the magic mark where you can really start understanding it pretty quickly. But it's going to be frustrating the first few times, you know, because you're going to keep failing and failing and failing. And that's what I did, too, in the beginning. And then you get better eventually. But if you don't set your time limit to, like, a short amount of time, then you will start um, trying to get busy fixing your mistakes. And if you fix your mistakes, you don't know afterwards what you did wrong. And then you basically uh, stop yourself from learning. You know, it's like a missed opportunity. So. Be careful with that. Don't don't like spend too much time on your paintings when you're learning still. Right? So this is starting to look really, really cool. Um, go back to that. Where's my leaves there? This is it. Okay. Um, let's see. We have the eyes. We have the LEDs and. Um, Let's see what else we can do. Maybe um, adding some more uh, blue highlights here. And emphasize the dawn slide here a little bit. Make it like a little bit hotter. This is cool. Okay, I think we're getting close. So, um, let me save this. I haven't saved this once. Scary. So uh, I'm gonna work on the least a little bit more. So we are at like one hour and 40 minutes and I'm about to be done here. So I'm gonna cut the feed very soon. But first of all, I have to finish up this painting. Carlos Vega, if it makes you feel better. So he's complaining that he didn't have breakfast and lunch because of me. Guess what? I didn't have breakfast and lunch either. I'm starving here, so I'm sacrificing myself. I hope that makes you feel bad. <laughs> it's more important for me to teach. That you guys can take stuff away from me. From what I'm basically showing here, that you guys can learn from it i don't need breakfast if you guys can learn so okay this is cool and um, what i'm gonna do now is i'm gonna do some final adjustments at this point so um what i'm gonna do is i what i like to do is like i select everything oh no what is this this is not what i wanted so i select everything Control a Control shift c uh, copies everything. I paste this um, on top of everything. I set this layer to screen. What it does is like, um, it, uh, yeah, it basically screens the layers and then I can add like an overall glow. This is always what I love doing, you know. So this is like a nice glow. And then I use the levels adjustment. Like that. 
to really focus the glow on only on the bright areas. This is maybe a little bit too aggressive, so I'm gonna lower the opacity as well. And then I'm gonna create a vignette. So the way I do it, like there's many ways to do it, the way I do it today, so I'm gonna just fill a layer, mask it, then invert the mask, and then you can go into the mask options here. In the mask properties, you can feather the edge like that. And then I'm gonna just lower the opacity. And this will just bring the focus slightly more to the center. And then um, I think I'm overall satisfied with the colors. But let me try to see if I can color balance it to make it a little, punch it a little bit more. Let's see if it helps. Before, after, before, ah, uh, yeah, slightly. It's a very, very slight balance. But um, what's missing is my signature. So I'm gonna. So Athena is asking, do you ever use multiply or overlay? Not for, only for final adjustments and never use those things for painting because um, you don't have control over color. Like you've seen that at no time I used any layer mode to paint. It's because I wanna stay in control over the colors and I don't want the computer to do that for me because then I don't get the results I want. So that's like very important um, to remember. So let me hide those effects and go to the foreground layer again and just make it a little bit darker so you can actually see my signature. All right, put it back on. And this is it, guys. Uh, I call this piece finished and I'm gonna upload the final piece with the Photoshop files and the brushes um, onto my Patreon. I'm gonna post the link everywhere. So um, yeah, I hope you enjoyed my live stream. I'm gonna do another one next Sunday um, with probably less talking, but um, yeah, and you will only be able to see it if you support me on Patreon uh, for $9 and up. Uh, so check it out if you like. And um, what you need to know also is like the moment you pledge, you have access to all previous live streams as well which is like seven in total next week it's gonna be eight so that database it keeps on growing so it's actually a pretty good steal for nine dollars a month to get all those insights um i would have definitely done it when i was a student but those things were unfortunately not available yet um so yeah uh, support me on patreon dot 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 patreon dot com slash goro and also following me on Facebook for all the new art. Join the uh, virtual painting Facebook group for VR paintings. That's a whole new thing that's growing right now. And I'm trying to like uh, uh, develop a community so people can share and learn from each other. So those are the things. Uh, I hope you enjoyed my live stream and see you next time. Bye guys.